So hypothetical question. You just got really great news. Maybe you got that promotion at work. Maybe you found your significant other. Maybe you heard that you got into that school you wanted. Whatever thing, if you will. Who is the first person you want to tell? Like right now, as you're listening to this, think about it. Who is the first person that crosses your mind when you want to tell them something? Hi, you guys. Welcome back to Fair Oquitu. I'm your host, Adriana, and today I just wanted to share some thoughts, as always, <laughs> that um, that just has come to mind and I just felt like I needed to share. Uh, a friend of mine posed this question on our podcast, Single Like a Pringle, and if you haven't listened to it, feel free to go back and check um, check it out. But this question that she posed was actually a statement, and it's, what's your source? And it's actually the title of this podcast, and it got me thinking, what is your source? When something exciting happens, who's the first person you go to? And be honest, like real talk, who is that first person you want to tell? Or maybe it's when you need help, when you need guidance, advice. Like who is that first person that you're like, yes, this is a person that I can go to. Now we know that the Lord should be our source of everything. And when things go great, we should go to him. And when they're not, we should go to him. And I just wanted to share some thoughts that had been coming to my mind of what happens when the Lord is not your source. And if you find yourself in these situations, to correct it. Um, and as, as I'm mentioning these, I, I want you to think within yourself because you... You might not know yourself completely in and out, but you see yourself when no one else does sometimes. When you're by yourself, in your own thoughts, when you go on a walk and you're just meditating on whatever it is, whatever it is that you that consumes your time, what is your source? Now, the first thought that came to mind when the Lord Jesus is not your source is you can make long-term decisions for something in a short-term season. I'm going to say that again. You can potentially make a long-term decision for something that is in a short-term season. Now, we know seasons don't last forever. You know, wherever state you live in, country, whatever the part of the world that you live in, chances are you're not always in the same season. If you're in Arizona... You're not always going to be in a hundred plus degree weather. If you're in Chicago, let's say, you're not always going to have snow or wind all the time, even though it's known as this windy city, you know, like in the Pacific Northwest, it's not always going to rain. So if you think about it, you could potentially be making a decision that's going to affect you for a long time because of a short-term season that you're in. Now, what came to mind on this was the story of Jacob and Esau. As we know, God made a promise to Abraham. You know, I'm going to bless you. Um, your, I believe it was your children. are going to be more numerous than, than the sand. Um, and, you know, God did. God was faithful. God blessed him. And, you know, God made a promise that, that he was going to have offspring, right? And it seemed at the time that might not have happened is what they potentially thought, you know, they're advanced in years. And God blessed them with Isaac. And let's, you know, for those that might not know the history, we're just going to jump past the fact that his wife, who was also her sister, but you know, again, we're just going to move past that. It's the Bible. It's the truth. It's the living word of God. They tried to, she said, oh, well, maybe it's not going to happen and tried to kind of be like, hey, use this girl instead because I can't get, you know, pregnant. And God was like, 
no, I mean, I'm still going to bless him, but this isn't who, like, this isn't where it's going to come from, you know? So God blesses Abraham and then asks him to sacrifice his son. And, you know, he wields up the weapon, he gets stopped, and they continue, right? Now, flash forward to Jacob and Esau. I'm going to turn to Genesis 25, verses 27 to 34. Now, the word says, When the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter, an outdoorsman. But Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. But Rebekah, who is Isaac's wife, uh, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew... Esau came in from the field exhausted. He said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff because I'm exhausted. That is why he was also named Edom. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, said Esau, I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. He ate, drank, got up, and went away. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, this came to mind, and so I looked back a few chapters. And it covered God blessing Abraham. And it covered him being asked to sacrifice his son. And I find it very hard to believe, and this is just speculation at this point right now, like this is pure speculation. But imagine God, okay? The creator of the universe and everything that is in it that that made us, God, okay? Who is not a human being, like the mighty, powerful, great God, makes a promise to a man named Abraham. And asks him, sacrifice your son Isaac. And he, you know, wields up the weapon, like I said. And then he gets stopped. I find it very hard to believe that Isaac doesn't tell his kids, hey, by the way, this God who is a creator and is holy and just amazing and magnificent and mighty, he gave us a promise. You know? And if God, like, fulfilled his promise, like, hey, I, like, God promised me, like being Isaac, but promised me to my parents, you know, and like God was faithful and gave, gave me to my parents. And like God has this promise through my parents. And now that gets passed on to him and then his offspring. Again, speculation, but Esau was the firstborn. And the Bible commentary says, as the firstborn, Esau was entitled to a double portion of his father's possession that is twice as much as any other son might inherit. He also became the tribal or family head. This was known as the birthright. In Esau's case, it would have also included being the ancestor of the Messiah. One day, as Esau was returning from a hunting trip, he saw Jacob cooking some red stew. He asked for some of the red stuff so imploringly that he got the nickname Red, which is also Edom, and it stuck to him and to his posterity, the Edomites. When Jacob offered some soup in exchange for Esau's birthright, Esau foolishly agreed. Now think about this logically and humanly. Esau was an expert hunter and an outdoorsman. Could he not, yes, he was tired, but could he not have hunted something? An expert, he's not just like an okay outdoorsman or an okay hunter like I shoot and sometimes I hit it or not. Expert, like an expert outdoorsman, okay? He couldn't have figured anything out. And I'm not saying this to judge him. I'm just telling you like dissecting the story. And then if God made a promise to his father and his grandfather, would he not have been faithful in that moment for him? You guys? Things at the moment might seem tough. Like, he, the Bible is clear. The, 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 the word of God is the truth, and it is what it is. 
He was tired. He was exhausted. That's, that's what the Bible says. He, it was a legit thing. He was tired and exhausted. But in that tiredness and that exhaustion, he made a decision that literally affected his entire life. And then I believe, I was, well, obviously, naturally, also his family. You know? Like, the Bible says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know? It's not worth making decisions in the moment that are might be rash or because you're like, well, I'm tired, get over it, you know? Like, it could affect you in the long term. There are people that get angry and because they're so angry, they kill somebody and then they end up going to jail. In one moment of anger, the consequence is jail. And some become jealous or upset or covet something of someone else and they might say something and those words could scar that of the person. You could literally potentially damage, if not ruin, a very good relationship because in the moment you made a decision that now affected something in the long term. Now a verse that keeps coming to mind is, you know, as you're facing things that do come up because they come up, it is so important to put your trust in the Lord. And I'm not joking. I keep I keep turning to these Bible verses. And this morning, as I was having my moment with the Lord, I literally turned to this again. And I just want to share it. It's Isaiah 25, 4. For you have been a stronghold for the poor person. A stronghold for the needy in his distress. A refuge from storms and a shade from heat. When the breath of the violent is like a storm against a wall. And also Isaiah 26, 4. Trust in the Lord forever because in the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. The second point that I wanted to emphasize, emphasize, um, to share or touch on is when the Lord is not your source, you lose sight of him. Now this is a given, but is it possible that we as followers of Jesus can be so focused on things like serving our circumstances or our problems or even opposition from the enemy that we lose sight of him? Now, if you're walking with God, you yourself that is listening to this right now, if you're walking with God and you're following in step with him, step by step, you're matching his pace. If he were to stop and pause, would you notice or keep walking? Because you didn't realize he stopped. Because you were so focused on other things other than him. School, financial problems, issues at home, issues at church, issues in the ministry you're serving in. Would you notice he stopped? The story of Peter came to mind on this and he was in a boat and Jesus was walking towards him and he said, you know, tell me to come. So he comes. And a human man, okay, like I know we, we hear these stories in the Bible and we forget, like, put yourself in his feet for a moment. Okay, close your eyes if you have to. You're sitting in a boat with other disciples. Close your eyes. <laughs> the wind is is going whatever. The ocean waves are are going back and forth. You're in a boat, it's rocking a little bit, whatever. And Jesus tells you to step out. So you lift one foot up and you go and you place it on top of the water and it's it's sturdy, it holds. And you take your other feet out of the boat and you put it on the water and you're literally standing on top of water, defying gravity. And you're focused on Jesus. 
But then you notice the water and you start to fall. Now Jesus caught him. We know that. But could it be possible that we lose sight of him sometimes? Now the song Fear is a Liar came to mind and I heard this song like two weeks ago and I've heard this song so many times, honestly, but it hit different this time and I really wanted to share it with you guys. The words go, when he told you you're not good enough, when he told you you're not right, when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight, when he told you you're not worthy, when he told you you're not loved, when he told you you're not beautiful, You'll never be enough. And the second verse says, When he told you you were troubled, you'll forever be alone. When he told you you should run away, you'll never find a home. When he told you you were dirty and you should be ashamed. When he told you you could be the one that grace could never change. And the beautiful chorus, Oh, fear. He is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear. He is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire, because fear, he is a liar. Could it be sometimes that we're afraid? That in our fear we lose sight of Jesus and we fall, we stumble. And how do we focus on Jesus when we lose sight of him? Now imagine an angry dog is barking at you. You're cornered, you can't go anywhere, and it's a good-sized vicious dog. And it's just barking and barking, and you can practically see the spit coming out as he's just angry and just ready to charge It's loud. It has your full attention and you're so focused. Will it bite? Will it attack? Like what it would do? But what if that very dog that was viciously barking at you and you were hyper-focused, like what is going to happen? You know, you're on edge. What if that dog had a lion behind it? Regardless if that lion was roaring or not, what if that that dog had a lion behind it? behind it would you be more afraid of the dog or the lion now what if that lion was also your protector you wouldn't be afraid of it because a dog compared to a lion is no match now let us remember that our lion of judah is with us and in us through his spirit hallelujah Philippians 4.13, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The third point that I wanted to make was, you can hurt someone when Jesus is not your source. And the thing that came to mind was the story of David and Bathsheba. Not going to get too into the details of this, but David one day went out on, I believe, outside and he noticed a lady bathing on a rooftop and I've heard the commentary of what is a woman even doing on a rooftop to begin with a married woman bathing but again we're not gonna stay too focused on that he asked David asked who who is that lady and the person came back and was like that's a wife of this person and she comes over never mind the fact that Bathsheba had a choice to make too fully knowing she was married, but again, we're going to move past that. I've heard that side of it preached before. He lies with her. She gets pregnant. And as a result, Bathsheba's husband gets put at the front of the line, from what I recall, the story, and dies. When we lose sight of God, we can hurt someone. And sometimes those actions that we do in the moment cannot be undone. Now, knowing all these things, these points, I'm sure there are other points that 
could have come to mind to you, but we're not going to just sit here and wallow. We can, but what would it do? So what do we do to change it? And it's one thing to recognize and acknowledge an issue, but it's another thing to change it. You know, like James, we we see in the in in the the word of God, we see what's going on. You know, as we're examining ourselves according to the word of God, like where do we stand? You, me, right now, where do we stand with the Lord? Where do we stand? Because God sees the heart. God sees the genesis of our motivations and, and all that we are. You know, like we covered that in the last podcast. But what do we do to change it? And I have one point. One point, that's it. And it's simple. We repent. We turn away from whatever is hindering us and we go to the Lord. Now, I wanted to read Jeremiah 8 because I keep turning to this again over and over and over again. And I don't even have a bookmark on it. And I'm just going to read it. Because as I'm flipping to it, I think it's important. Now, I used to stay a lot in the New Testament. But as we know that God hasn't changed, he doesn't change and he will never change. He's the same God. He's the same God that walked with the children of Israel as they crossed through the Red Sea. He was the same God that went with David as he fought Goliath and with Daniel as he was in a den full of real lions. Jeremiah 8 says, At that time, this is the Lord's decoration. The bones of the kings of Judah, the bones of her officials, the bones of the priests, the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the residents of Jerusalem will be brought out of their graves. They will be exposed to the sun, the moon, and all the stars in the sky which they have loved, served, followed, consulted, and worshipped. Their bones will not be collected and buried, but will become like manure on the soil's surface. Death will be chosen over life by all the survivors of this evil family, those who remain wherever I have banished them. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. You are to say to them, this is what the Lord says. Do people fall and not get up again? If they turn away, do they not return? Why have these people turned away? Why is Jerusalem always turning away? They take hold of deceit. They refuse to return. I have paid careful attention. They do not speak what is right. No one regrets his evil, asking, what have I done? Everyone has stayed his course, like a horse rushing into battle. Even storks in the sky know their seasons. Turtle doves, swallows, and cranes are aware of their migration. But my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. The note says punishment for Judah's leaders. How can you claim we are wise? The law of the Lord is with us. In fact, the lying pen of scribes have produced falsehood. The wise will be put to shame. They will be dismayed and snared. They have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they really have? Therefore, I will give their wives to other men, their fields to new occupants. For from the least to the greatest, everyone is making profit dishonestly. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have treated the brokenness brokenness of my dear people superficially, claiming peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they acted so detestably? They weren't at all ashamed. They could no longer feel humiliation. Therefore, they will fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they will collapse, says the Lord. I will gather them and bring them to an end. This is the Lord's declaration. There will be no grapes on the vine, no figs on the fig tree, and even the leaf will wither. Whatever I have given them 
will be lost to them. And the note here also says, God's people unrepentant. Why are we just sitting here? Gathered together, let us enter the fortified cities and perish there. For the Lord our God has destroyed us. He has given us poison water to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. We hoped for peace, but there was nothing good. For time of healing, but there was only horror. From Dan, the snorting of the horses is heard. At the sound of the neighing of mighty steeds, the whole land quakes. They come to devour the land and everything in it, the city and all its residents. Indeed, I am about to send snakes among you, poisonous vipers that cannot be charmed. They will bite you. This is the Lord's decoration. And then it ends with the note, Lament for Judah. My joy has flown away. Grief has settled on me. My heart is sick. Listen, the cry of my dear people from a faraway land. Is the Lord no longer in Zion, her king not within her? Why have they angered me with their carven image, with their worthless foreign idols? Harvest has passed, summer has ended, but we have not been saved. I am broken by the brokenness of my dear people. I mourn. Horror has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? So why has the healing of my dear people not come about? God has not changed. He hasn't. Now we know our God is mighty and strong. And he can take a lot. And he is loving and merciful and gracious. But is he also not jealous and holy, holy and holy? I think of myself and I know that I need to go back to my Lord and Savior, to my mediator, Jesus Christ, and ask him for mercy and forgiveness and grace. Because again, while he's loving and so gracious and so merciful, he is jealous, you guys. He doesn't want half our heart, half of our devotion, half of our attention. He wants our full focus and for him to be all that we are, all of our happiness, all of our joy, and everything to be in Him. So what do we do? We repent. We turn away from anything that is worthless. And let's go to our mediator. Another Bible passage that I wanted to share with you guys was Isaiah 1, 16 to 18. Wash yourselves. Cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Pursue justice, correct the oppressor, defend the rights of the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. Let us run to our mediator and let us let him cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The next verse that I wanted to share was John 1, 9 and it's, it has been one of the tools in my armor, if you will. And it's, if we confess our sins, he is good and faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Because when the enemy, enemy comes and he, he starts pointing his finger at me and he says, this, 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 and that. I can take this Bible verse and say that if I confess my sins, he is good and faithful to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So what do we do? We go to the source. That's Jesus. Sometimes we think we need to fix ourselves up. We need to go to a dry cleaner and, and clean our garment out and, and get as much of the stain out as we can so we can present ourselves before God and say, God, I'm a little dirty. But don't we know, if truth be told, God is everywhere and sees everything. You who are listening right now, do you really think that God is surprised 
when you confess something or when you're wrestling within yourself to confess something. He sees and knows all. Like he already knows. So go to him. Like run to him. Not your friend or whoever. Go to him. So he can forgive your sin and sins and then cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. As far as east is from the west, Psalm says he is so forgiven our sins. Let's go to him in prayer. Find him in the word, in fasting. It's simple, you guys. Go to him. Let him restore your joy, your hope, and give your soul that rest that it needs. And you guys, this episode is literally just a little packaged Costco sample. I know COVID has changed things. We know at Costco we used to go and get our samples, but this little episode is a Costco sample. Okay? Just a little taste. That's it. Now, as this episode comes to an end, I really want to challenge you to go to him. Go to his word and feast upon it. Like, go to him. Go to him broken. Go to him tired, frustrated, weary, unsure and uncertain, angry, happy, joyful, content. Run to Jesus And let him be your source of everything. So when someone asks you, what is your source? You can confidently say, the Lord, the Lord is my source. Until next time, let's be busy about doing the Father's will. God bless you guys.